Hello and welcome to another fantastic episode of RFRX. Uh, my name is Eric Wells and I am the support group director for Recovering from Religion. And with me today as my co-host is Helen Green and she has so many roles. It is fantastic. I love how plugged into Recovering from Religion she is. She's an ambassador, she's a support group leader, and she also supports the agents over on the helpline. And uh, I got to tell you, she does a fantastic job. So Helen, welcome. Thank you so much for co-hosting with me today. Absolutely. I love, I love these. I love being here. I love being part of an RFR. I'm excited for tonight. So hello, everybody. I hope everybody has a wonder, enjoys the talk and has a wonderful time. So let's get this thing rolling. <laughs> <laughs> well, like at the beginning of every RFRX, we have a poll and these poll questions are kind of designed to get you in the mindset about what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, the answers are anonymous, so we're not going to be able to know how you answer. So, um, um, answer truthfully. What have you got to lose? All right. The first question is, have you personally known a pastor or religious leader who has deconverted and left the faith? The two answers there, yes or no. Uh, second question, do you feel anger towards those former religious leader or leaders that taught and led you and your faith communities? Yes, I feel they misled me. Maybe not anger, but other emotions No, they were doing what was passed down to them. Haven't really thought about it. None of the be above, or I'm still religious. And the third question, and in your opinion, what might be the biggest challenges facing religious leaders who want or have left the faith, uh, the either loss of career or income loss of family, friends, and community mental health challenges, divorce, or some other issue not listed above. So uh, we're going to have that poll running um, uh, for the whole introduction. And uh, once we start introducing our guests, we're going to go ahead and close that out. Uh, so we're here at RFRX, but what the heck is this all about? We, every Monday, every Monday evening here in the U.S., and it's uh, Tuesday over in Australia, we've got some Australians with us today, um, we bring on guests to discuss topics that are relevant to the folks who come to RFR for help. These are a lot of topics that come up in the support group. They are come up in the helpline chat um, and it, it's stuff that we just hear and the people are struggling with. This is not at all a replacement for those communities or those other programs and services that Recovering from Religions offers. It is um, complementary to that. And we offer, or these experts that we bring on, these guests that we bring on offer great advice and coping skills. If you've got any questions or comments, they can be emailed to us at rfrx at recoveringfromreligion.org. Or if you missed this one and you want to see, or, or even want to see some others that we've done, because we've got, I think this is the 70th episode we've done. You can go to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash recovering from religion. Helen, I've been talking way too long. What the heck is RFR? Tell us about recovering from religion. So what do we do at RFR? So our mission statement is, is that we offer hope, healing, and support to those struggling with issues of doubt and non-belief. And, and how do we offer those things to the people that reach out to us? So um, first we offer healing, which is that uh, you can contact us if you go to our website, www.recoveringfromreligion.org and connect with one of our awesome, um, really well-trained agents on the line. You can either call or chat in on the helpline um, and you will um, be connected to one of our agents that will help you work through your questions of doubt or if there's um, any sort of like family or friend trickle that you're dealing with, whatever topic you have regarding religion and faith, um, you'll be connected with someone that can help um, be a listening ear and offer um, no judgment, no criticism, just and also offer resources to you if you need them. Um, it's available 24-7 with the online chat or the phone calls. And if you need to, you can also schedule a phone call and one of our agents will call you back. Um, we also have a resource page that offers a whole bunch of resources, articles, videos, books that can help you on your journey. So I definitely recommend that you go ahead and check that out as well. Even if you're not looking for recovering right now, but just need a, like a little bit of resources to put some more tools in your toolbox, that will be, that will, that's a great place to find some. And Eric, why don't you talk a little about the hope side of things? Excellent. Yes. Hope. This is, uh, um, if, 
I'm struggling with something and it's like dark times for me. Um, hearing somebody else's story, how they kind of got through it, that could be really helpful to me. Uh, that would help uh, possibly give me a light at the end of the tunnel. Like, oh, if this person got through it, then I might be able to get through it. So we offer those, uh, the hope part, we pursue the hope part of our uh, mission through the blog, uh, medium.com slash excommunications, and also through the podcast. On the podcast, there's a ton of past episodes with people sharing their stories and talking about um, how religion has affected them. And then also we're starting to put these RFRX um, episodes up there as well. And so if you don't want to watch YouTube, you can pull down one of these um, RFRX episodes. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and drop the link into the chat for those things. All right, Helen, you get to talk about my favorite part about RFR. Okay, so I, yeah, so this is my favorite part of it too. Um, so we also offer support. So how we do this through our peer support groups. Um, I am one of the um, leaders of our virtual chapter. And basically these are face-to-face -face meetings, um, usually online um, because of the pandemic, we, um, we kind of moved into an online format. Hopefully soon, once things get back to normal, there'll be face-to-face um, -face meetings in your city, hopefully. And basically you can um, chat with people from all over the world. You're not, um, the ones that we have listed online, even though it's listed by city, you are not restricted to that city. You can pop into any one you want and talk to other people that are going through similar situations. And that can be really wonderful because you're talking with people that are probably have dealt with something similar to what you're going through or exactly what you're going through. And you can find support and friendships and people that just want to give you a helping hand so and those can be found on meetup um and i'm sure eric's going to post or he posted that in the chat and he's now going to talk to us if you need <laughs> something more beyond just a support group <laughs> yeah folks if you uh, enjoy the support groups but you're want missing like the in-person stuff uh the in-person meetings get vaccinated for fuck's sake uh all right <laughs> moving on i'm not going to step off that soapbox <laughs> and talk about the I'm second therapy man. project uh, i know i got back to two <laughs> uh, feels so good uh the secular therapy project um Helen talked about the helpline and she also talked about the support groups. Both of those are peer support. We do offer training on how to uh, work with people that come to either support group or the helpline, but it's nowhere near uh, what a professional mental health uh, person, individual is trained for. Uh, and we don't really want to do that. We can't really offer that. So in those in support group, in the helpline, we don't diagnose people. We don't really even give advice. Um, and so, but sometimes we really do kind of need that stuff. We need more than what peer support can offer. And so we've set up the secular therapy project. And I've talked about this before. This is where I, as a client, can be connected with a secular therapist, either near me or in my state who can do, because telehealth is now a big thing. And um, uh, able to, and these these therapists are vetted to make sure that they have the appropriate licensing in their state or the country to make sure that they're maintaining a secular practice, uh, so you won't get proselytized to. We have like twenty two thousand people who have signed up and created an account with a, a secular therapy project. We only have five hundred therapists so far. We need some more therapists. So, folks. If you are working with a therapist that you think would be great for the Secular Therapy Project, or even no one, please, please uh, direct them over to the Secular Therapy Project and um, uh, get them started with the application process, because that's something that we need. We're finding a lot of people aren't able to uh, connect with therapists because they're so booked, uh, booked up at the moment. All right. I've rambled on. <laughs> Tell us about the online community. And while I shut my phone off. Okay, so um, also at RFR, um, you if you chat in and um, or call in, and one of the agents finds that you could benefit 
um, from, you know, a little bit more community, chatting with people from similar backgrounds. Um, you can enjoy our platform on Slack. You have to be invited for an agent. You can't find it online. And um, basically, this is a great place, like, if you come from a Jehovah's Witness background or you got into, like, New Age stuff or Catholic or Jewish or whatever it is, you can meet other people that are also going through the deconverting process or doubting or, and just have um, conversations about your experiences, offer um, resources and um, laughs and memes to each other and all that sort of thing. So that's a really great resource that we have. Um, you will, there's sometimes like a Sunday night Zoom meeting for everybody to get together. And also you can um, also talk with the agents and, um, and have like a more like, you know, a little bit more personal one-on-one -on -one, like you know, or like group chats with them as well, you know, goofy, friendly, but you can still find the support that you're looking for. Um, I'm also, if you're also looking for a little bit of an extended community that um, is outside of RFR, um, you can join the ACS community of Discord where um, I facilitate and have many friends on. There's a wonderful group of people on there that you can chit chat with and make friends with and hang out. And also, um, if you love what we do and would like to um, put on your put on your go get them boots and help us out, you can volunteer with us. We're always looking for people that want to volunteer, that um, really want to reach out to people that um, are struggling and need a little bit of support. So we could always. Um, use volunteers it, like and I can tell you that for myself um, and I'm sure the other volunteers will tell you that be, um, being a part of our part gives us um, meaning and purpose to our, our lives not that we've left religion and it's a great way to meet people and learn and discover more about yourself and others so um, if you are interested in volunteering please hit that link and fill out an application and get started because we would really appreciate it and whatever skill you have we will find you a home <laughs> so <laughs> exactly well said well, folks, um, that's going to wrap up kind of our introduction and uh, I'll let you know kind of what to expect for the rest of the show. For the first hour or so, it's kind of no hard point because we're not like on a network show or anything like that. <laughs> for the first hour or so, we're going to have the discussion um, uh, with our, our expert here, our, our fantastic guest. And during that discussion, I hope, and you probably will have some questions. And so if you have those questions, please type them into the chat. And that goes for you, um, Atheist Community Discord. Type those in the chat because the Discord channel is getting monitored as well. And so for the second half of the discussion, it'll be a Q&A part for about 20, uh, 20, 25 minutes or so. And that's where we're going to be asking our fantastic guests those questions. After that, we're going to tell you who's coming up next week, and we'll have some closing thoughts by Dr. Del Ray, our founder and president for Recovering from Religion. And then once that's all done, we're going to shut the recording off and open up the lines, um, and we'll just have a big old hangout. We do this every week, and it's a really, really great uh, experience for the folks who stick around. So without further ado, Helen, who the heck is on tonight? Well, I want to give a, a, a wonderful, warm welcome to Charles Hill. He was raised in an evangelical home. After a four-year career with, with the Columbus, Ohio Police Department, he had an experience which led him to leave that career behind to enter full-time ministry. Charles and his wife started several successful churches, preached multiple times every weekend to locations around the world, and were well-known Christian conference speakers just before their theological worldview came crashing down. I'm sure many of us can relate to that. Following their deconversion, they lost income, family, friends, and community. He has been an RFR support group leader since 2014, as well as being a communications director and a board member for the clergy project. Charles and his wife, Tiffany, have been married for 25 years and have three amazing children. So Charles, please begin. And we, we'd love to hear what you have to say. And we're, thank you very much for giving us this presentation. You are welcome. It's great. It's great to be here tonight. I don't know if I'm an expert, but uh, <laughs> I, will certainly, I will certainly do my best. Well, Charles, uh, what, are we, what are you here to talk about? And, and kind of like, a, yep. let's, let's do some of the bare bones stuff first. 
So the clergy project, yeah. um, I was trying to furiously, I didn't catch the final tally there from the poll, but it was interesting. 38% is what I had. And then it flashed off the screen on the final tally. 38% said, yes, they have. 64% said, no, they hadn't. And I'm really interested too in the second question, because it's something that I, I, a lot of people tend to not want to process or process through because we were the pastor. So do you feel anger toward those religious leaders that taught and led you in your faith communities? And 23% said yes. And I validate that feeling. You are 1000% allowed to have that feeling. Uh, 23%, maybe not anger, but other emotions. 30% know they were doing what was passed down to them. And 5% haven't thought about it. So um, the clergy project is, uh, you know, what we're here to talk about tonight. And it has to do with those that were former professional paid or otherwise professional staff on a church. Maybe they were a missionary. Maybe they were a worship leader um, in a church. And they eventually realized that they no longer could believe. And so in order to be a member of the clergy project, you have to A, be a, a former professional paid staff person at a ministry, and B, no longer hold any supernatural beliefs at all. And I, go ahead. So this, I, um, I kind of get the feeling that uh, we'll be using like, uh, pastor quite a bit in this conversation, but this would extend, would this extend towards just about any religious leader, like a, a priest or a rabbi or a imam or something like that? Absolutely. We do have, we do have priests. We have uh, plenty of priests from the Catholic church, imams. We have uh, former Buddhists that are a part of it. Primarily, though, the makeup of the clergy project is still focused in the United States and it, it's the typical people that you think would be a pastor or maybe a youth pastor, a children's pastor. Mm. Um, we do have a lot of missionaries too, uh, you know, that went to other countries. Oh, too. wow. I didn't consider that. Yep. Yeah. We, um, every now and then through the support group, uh, we get emails from missionaries. Uh, I'm in Africa, in a country in Africa, and I have stopped believing. I don't know what to do. It's uh, it's it, we direct them to the clergy project, but it's heart wrenching for me to see that like they're thousands of, of miles away from their home and um, not really in a place that they want to be both mentally and physically. Yeah, we've had several people over the years show up at our group unbeknownst to me. And and we've had several missionaries, probably three, maybe four. And yeah. uh, they came to our RFR group. I don't want to be confusing here because. RFR is such a huge part of my life, as is the clergy project, and I really see them one and the same. So it's a good time to kind of delineate that like we did at the beginning. RFR is just a very wide, broad, if you are struggling with your faith, if you still might even be in it, if you were a former pastor or not. But the clergy project is really a very confidential, secretive, mm -hmm. um, you have to work you know, pretty hard to vet yourself to get in because of the confidentiality group that's focused in much the same way as RFR. But if you're still struggling, if you've got one foot in and one foot out, you're not admitted to the clergy project yet. You, you, you need to be free of supernatural belief. And you don't shake it all about. <laughs> no. Got it. What's the, the mission statement for the clergy project? Well, if you want the absolute formal <laughs> mission statement of the clergy project, it is uh, the, 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 the mission of the clergy project is to provide support, community, and hope to current and former religious professionals without supernatural beliefs. So we do have a, a fairly large number of people that um, are still currently actively pastoring in a church and they feel stuck. They, they don't know how to get out. And so they make contact with us and we provide resources and game plans and things to help them transition out um, into another career. And then we've got plenty of people that were former pastors and, and clergy that join as well. 
Um, I, I'm not at all, uh, or have never been a professional clergy member. So it would be kind of hard for me to understand like what would be different about um, a professional clergy. Like I could imagine it would be mentally difficult to be coming up with a, a service every or, or a pre a preaching every su- Sunday and, and not really believing what you're saying, but is, uh, is there more than just, just those kinds of things? Yeah, it might be a good time for me to back up to just a little bit. Uh, let me just give a tiny little history just so people know how it started. I think that would be important. Is that okay? Perfect. Perfect. I mean, it, it actually, if you really trace it back, it started in 1984 on the Oprah show when Dan Barker, many of you know Dan Barker, mm-hmm. um, went on national TV and talked about leaving his faith behind. Um, in 1992, he published a book. Um, and let me see, I don't want to get this wrong. Losing faith and faith from preacher to atheist. So Dan at that time was leading uh, Freedom From Religion Foundation. He published this book. Well, fast forward to 2006. Between those years of 1984 and 2006, Dan would start to meet all of these people that were in the ministry or they were former clergy that had lost their faith. And they didn't realize that there was anybody else out there like them. Now I can tell you that's very similar to RFR. We have people that show up at our support group every week And they say, I didn't really know there was anything like this out there. So very much the same similar thing. These pastors would think that there was nobody else out there that would have ever deconverted. They didn't know who to talk to. They didn't know what to do. So he started keeping a database over 20 years of all of these people. And from my understanding, he really didn't know what to do with it. Um, Fast forward to 2006, uh, a small... Uh, some of you might know him. He's got a small following, Richard Dawkins, um, (laughs) met up and was speaking at the same conference that uh, Dan was in Iceland. And Richard Dawkins had just released the God delusion. And he had heard about this, you know, Dan Barker guy and what he was doing. And he really had a desire to help. He really wanted to help some of these pastors make this transition. And so they had their first conversation in 2006. They met again in 2008. And Dawkins again pushed Dan and said, hey, how can I help? And so from 2008, they started really plotting this thing out. In 2011, in Washington, D.C., there was a nice group of people that met. At that time, Daniel Dennett was involved. I think many of you might know his name. And they, they just started dreaming of this place that Uh, pastors that felt trapped that were currently in the ministry or that formerly were in the ministry could get help. They actually kind of envisioned it as a halfway house. But what they, what they came up with as this first step was an online forum where people could privately and secretly log in and be able to share many of those challenges specifically that clergy face that are, um, kind of hiding in the pulpit, which was the name of Linda Loscola and Dan Dennett's, you know, groundbreaking work where they actually looked and researched um, and and did some very in-depth reporting on clergy that were stuck in the pulpit or had transitioned. Um, Fast forward then, I mean, it's a really interesting story. You can go to uh, clergyproject.org. I'm sure we'll mention that again and read the full story. But in March, on March 20th of 2011, Um, Dan Barker and several other people reached out to all of these people that they had in their database, the people that they had interviewed in the quantitative study, and 52 charter members were welcomed into the clergy project. And from there, there was an online forum where people could meet and talk, much like we do in our RFR meetings every week, about the struggles of what it takes to overcome you know, losing your faith while still active in the clergy or as a former clergy and still struggling with some of those things. So that's, that's just a unique little background about how it started and kind of who the catalysts were in the movement. Um, RFR started in 2009. So it seems like there was this, uh, and, and a lot of other foundations um, uh, and even uh, um, podcasts kind of started up at that time. So it seems like there was this big confluence of ideas like 
okay, we like the people identified, we need to do something. And they, they started stuff out. That's, that's, I had no idea that such um, luminaries uh, really were involved at, at the very beginning. Uh, that's, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, the more and more people that cross Dan's path or reached out to Richard Dawkins or Daniel Dennett or Linda Lascola, um, you know, they just said, hey, this is, this is more than just a few people. This is kind of almost an epidemic uh, that's, that's going on and it's still going on today. I mean, we see, um, fast forward, I'll give you some stats. I mean, currently we have one right around 1,150 people in the clergy project and I see a couple of them here. I'm not going to scroll through. It's so good to see some of you here. Um, I see Maureen Hart. She is our, our screener. If it, if Maureen's waving there. If it wasn't for Maureen, I don't know if the thing would still be running. She really takes care of so many things for us. So she's, she's awesome to have, but there's so you 1, have 11, 1100 members, members currently, is this just like at the moment or is this over the whole existence of clergy project? No, this is over the entire existence around 1,150. That's amazing. Um, yeah, that's a lot. I mean, when you really stop and think about it, when I, when I applied for the clergy project, you did not apply uh, online, you kind of typed out your thing and sent it in. And it took me over a year. I mean, I was terrified. Yeah, I was terrified. We'll get into more of that. But it, it took me a year to sign up and, and get the courage to send that in. I was just scared. And when, when about was that? For me, I, I joined in 20. It was either 13 or 14. I'm a horrible historian. That's why I wrote all that other stuff down. <laughs> That's why I was a believer. I'm a horrible historian. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, what are some of the unique challenges that um, the clergy face uh, when they like, w why is this so important? The work that the clergy project does. Yeah, I tell you, um, and I'm always cautious to say this um, because there is a lot of pain involved. I mean, I think 30 some percent of you said, you know, that there's some anger there from people just like me. I mean, I was the one standing up on the stage every week, uh, pumping this stuff out. Um, so I don't want to think more highly of ourselves than we should. But there is a unique challenge because for many of us, or most of us, I mean, especially, um, you know, I don't want to be sexist or, or throw this out, but a lot of men, right, find their identity in their work. They find their passion in their work. You know, when you meet somebody, you say, hey, I'm Charles. Hey, I'm Tim. Oh, hey, what do you do? So, so not only is it an identity, but it goes beyond that because it's a supernatural thing, right? I mean, it's your whole life. And if your family's entrenched in it and it's been a part of who you are, it's your complete identity. Um, you feel like you are some sort of superhero for God, right? It's our job to rescue people from going to burn in an eternity in hell forever. And you dedicate your life to that. You know you're not going to get paid maybe the, the most, and you're willing to give that up. You know that it's going to be a challenge. You know you're going to work long hours. Um, but you're willing to do it because you really feel like it's such a, a, a higher calling. So a lot of people, I, I don't know if they think of that at first. Obviously, career transition is a huge thing. I mean, if, if, when, you, when you deconvert from the faith and you deconstruct, obviously, for many of these pastors, like I have a master's of theology, that doesn't translate too well into the corporate world or something else. So a lot of these pastors, they don't know what to do to get a different job. They're not sure where they're qualified. They're not sure how to explain it. Because for those of us that, that haven't figured it out yet, uh, to be an atheist in America is somewhere below. I think last time, I, I honestly, I looked at the Pew Religious Forum, we were like two notches below like Islamic terrorists. Anybody mm -hmm. confirm that? I mean, yeah. that's literally where it was. So, yeah, you know, it's how do you build a resume? How do you do that? So loss of income. So one, the other, of the, the, one of the big issues that they face is that they're just not trained for anything but standing behind the pulpit. 
where else in, um, where else can you earn money uh, putting together a sermon every, every day or every, every week or, or uh, it sounds like communication is something that they learn, but um, so they struggle with, with real world job skills. Yep. So the transition out into the career is, is a big one. The other big one is, I mean, it's not easy to, uh, and, and many of you know this story. I mean, it's not easy to go to your spouse and say, I no longer believe. I mean, especially if, if it's a pastor's wife or a pastor's husband. We do have 157 females that are in the clergy project. So we're really seeing an uptick in female uh, people that are joining the clergy project. Maureen is one of those. Um, it's just not easy to go to your spouse and to say, I no longer believe, because for many of us, it might even be something that you hadn't talked about with your spouse, because that's a secret that if it gets out, it can wreck the church. <laughs> it can ruin the church. It can ruin your livelihood. And Maybe it's your spouse that's having questions. They don't want to talk about it either. So when you do talk about it, um, unfortunately, we see a lot of our people that when they deconstruct, they end up with a really rocky road to marriage. So a lot of our people are divorced. Um, then it gets into what do you do with the kids? And I know this is a common theme amongst many of, uh, of probably the viewers tonight because it is an RRFR group, you know that one person stays in the faith, one person doesn't. And how do you raise the kids? You know, they do one thing over here and one thing over there. So loss of, of just their, 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 their immediate family and their house is tough. And then you get into the extended family. And I think for a pastor, it's a little bit even bigger than that because we share so many moments with people when they're dying. We give them hope when they're dying. We counsel them when they're dying. We, we, we know some of their deepest, darkest secrets. And they really, you know, your extended family and friends and community feel a profound loss and almost a slap in the face when you, the person that they looked up to to receive this, this guidance from, turns their back on it. So that's a big challenge. Um, so from there, it rolls down into mental health issues. So you're setting up the perfect storm for just, you know, you've lost your career, you've lost your income, you're not sure what to do. Maybe you've lost your spouse, maybe you've lost your kids, you've lost your community, you've lost your, your, your faith. Um, and so there's a lot of profound mental health issues that go on as well. Your identity, it sounds like too, um, being wrapped up on it. Wow. What, um, what, you know, this might be a, a, off the topic question, but what does a pastor normally uh, make a professional clergy member normally make? Oh, you mean financially? Yeah. Like what are they, what's, what's, what are they losing other, I mean, of course, everything, but. Well, I mean, it depends on what kind of church you are. I mean, you know, you've got the Joel scenes of the world that probably make millions and then the I, rest. I don't think he's going to be showing up in the <laughs> clergy project. <laughs> I, 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 you know, honestly, it's all over the place. It's from people that volunteer and they hardly get paid anything. I would say the average, if I could throw an average out there, it would probably be maybe 40 or $50,000 a year. And that's a, that, that would be a decent, you know, medium sized church, you know, maybe with benefits. Um, you know, I think once you get in a larger church, 70, maybe these days, 60 or 70, I'm talking a pretty large church. Mm-hmm. Well, it so seems like it, from, go ahead, Helen. That's okay. So um, it seems like from what you've been describing that a lot of um, the issues that like the clergy that they face when they leave is can even be more complicated than like the pressure that is deconverting, you know, because there's this because for those of people that have deconverted, they might not lose their job. They might not lose the support system and stuff like that. So it seems like not only on top of the deconversion, they have to go through this complete lifestyle change and learning new skills and stuff. So that just adds more complications on top of already going on through the deconversion process in the first place. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's, 
it's it's a complete it's a complete overhaul. If you see me looking a little nervous, I mean, I'm used to speaking in front of, I, I've, I think I, probably the largest crowd was 15,000 people. I have no problem talking, but I, um, I'm having trouble getting words out because it's still a painful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, I understand. It sounds like it would be really painful, you know, yeah. and yeah, and it's gonna, it's gonna bring up those emotions and stuff. Right. So, you know, I definitely feel for you. I really do. Cause it sounds like yeah. it's very complicated and messy and not fun. And um, when you're going through that shift, it can be, uh, you know, traumatizing. So, you know, my heart really goes out to that because it is really, really complicated. And I don't think people, you know, really understand, you know, that side of it, you know, what's on the other side of, you know, the altar that was what's going on. Well, I think the, the toughest thing, um, you know, at least in my personal case, you know, I mean, you've got a, a, a mom and dad that are proud, you know, that, you know, their son's preaching five or six oh, times wow. a weekend in a large church. Wow. You know, they, they, they raised you in the faith you know, and, and you always want your kids to be successful and healthy. And if I I was raised in the evangelical church, that's my personal background. Um, And so, you know, it's a big deal. Uh, The Bible is the literal infallible word of God. And truly people go to an eternity in hell and burn forever if they don't know Christ. And so it's, it's a higher calling, you know, and if you're a part of this world, it'll make sense to, you know, rescue people from that eternity of separation. And so, you know, my, my, my mom and dad were super proud. My family was proud. They gave money. They gave a lot of money. It was very, very difficult to, you know, tell you, you tell your parents that, they raised you wrong. And, and you, you know, I mean, <laughs> that's, that's a tough, tough. That's, and, and I know that this is a similar story to many people out there. You, you, you had to do the same thing. I, I think the small departure is when you start thinking about um, the fact that you are, you know, unfortunately looked up to as as the person that has the advanced degree, the, the, the word from the Lord, and that you're making a difference in a community. Um, I mean, we were in a small community, a tiny little town. And I think our last Easter there, we had like 2,300 people in a town of, I, I think it was 2,900 people. Mm-hmm. And so you really do see some good impact of the church and that's up for debate. We have some really good talks in our RFR group about whether or not the church can, can bring some good. You know, certainly we saw people that, you know, left a lifestyle of drugs or other crazy things that were going on in their lives. But really we know that that higher power was themselves ready and willing to change. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a very tough transition. Um, for us, it was something that we didn't expect. My wife and I never talked about any kind of doubts. We never wanted to, you know, form that doubt with each other. And certainly you wouldn't go talking to anybody else about it because we know how word gets out. <laughs> yeah. You, you and I have talked, um, you know, in the past before, and um, this uh, for a lot of uh, kind of about this, and and for a lot of, uh, I think pastors or ministers, this is generational. Um, their their yep. fathers did it, their fathers' fathers did it, and their their fathers' father. You know, I've talked to folks who they can trace their pastoral <laughs> roots way back to the 18th, uh, 17th century, and. Right. Um, but that necessarily wasn't necessarily the, the case for you. How did, where did you kind of start out and how did you get into becoming a pastor in your small town? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll try to keep it a little bit brief here. Um, 
you know, I think we all have a really unique backstory, right? And when you start peeling back the layers, so, you know, uh, there were some dysfunctional things that were going on in the home, some alcoholism and things like that. My, my father was a professional traveling businessman, though. Um, so I saw some good leadership exemplified, but I saw a lot of dysfunction. Every Friday through Sunday was just a shit show at my house. And, you know, uh, my mom found solace in the church. And we would be at the church twice on Sunday and every Wednesday. And the church was our life. And if you're used to this kind of background, um, from an early age, you know, I was a little hyper and I could talk and I could be animated like this, you know, and, 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 and keep people's attention. And so it was always said to me that one day you're going to go on to do great things for the Lord. You're going to go on to, you know, truly win the nations, right, to use Christianese. And so from the time I was a smaller child, even, I remember people saying, you know, you have the gift from the Lord. So it was kind of almost, I, I felt like it was a little expected of me. Um, I, I kind of went through a little bit of a rebellious phase, I guess you would say, in, in college and kind of, again, forgive me for using all these Christian terms, but some of you will get it, was running from the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I became a police officer first in Columbus, Ohio. So I served and in the back of my mind, I always knew that one day I would, you know, kind of turn my life around a little bit. And it wasn't anything crazy. I mean, you know, uh, but I, I just, um, you know, wasn't as, as focused on the church and things like that as people would expect, but I was uh, on, on the scene of a drive-by shooting. Um, it was about my fourth year on, and there was a young man that, that had just been shot, and I was doing CPR on him, and his, his mom was sitting right beside him. Um, I can oh still goodness. hear it, see it. I, I can see it all, even to this day, mm -hmm. just holding his hand, saying, help him, Jesus, help him, Jesus, help him, Jesus, help him, Jesus, help him, Jesus. And I'm sitting there doing CPR on this young man. And as I drove away from there, I said, you know, it's time. It, it's time. It's time. Uh, the, the only thing that could have helped this young man is that maybe he find the Lord before uh, a police officer like myself comes and has to do CPR. He, he ultimately passed away. So it was a little epiphany to me. So I, 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 I went home. I told my wife, <laughs> this is really bad practice. I said, honey, I think it's time. Uh, you know, I, I think it's time to answer that call that I know I've always had. We're going to go off to seminary. So I went off and got my master's degree at, at Ashland Theological Seminary you know, did the whole thing, Hebrew, Greek, all of those things. And then we started a church. It's called being a church planter. They wanted me to start a church kind of in the Columbus area, but I really felt, it, and I think this makes it a lot harder for me. I, I really felt like I should start a church in this small kind of uh, economically dying area of, of Northeast Ohio. And so that's what we did. And, and, I don't know if you want me to continue on. I mean, but that's how I got into it. And so I was a pastor and we started churches and we had campuses. We had, I had a driver that would take me to other churches to speak. And if I wasn't live in the church, they would play a video. We had a campus in China where we would send our videos over and they would watch them in a house church. I mean, it was the whole nine yards. Charles, I know you're not following in on the chat, but you're getting a lot of support from the folks who are here. Your your story is touching them, and they're they're really reaching out. And uh, if mm -hmm. this was a live in person thing, I think you would be inundated with hugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, you um, were all in. You and your wife were all in on this uh, uh, being a pastor and saving lives and saving people from. Um, hell and, and damnation. And um, it sounds like uh, you were in front of a, a lot of people over the years as you were pastor. How long were you a, were, were you in, you were a pastor? Uh, I know you're not a great historian, but just. <laughs> well, I left the police department in 2000. Um, 
and I deconstructed in 20, late 2012, 2013. Yeah. What was kind of the trigger for you to start this deconstruction process? <laughs> I, well, I, I used to sit in, uh, I, I can still see it today, seventh grade. It, 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 and, and again, I don't have time and I don't want to get into my full story. It would make a lot more sense. Like I, I actually kind of grew up in a Bob Jones church. Extreme fundamentalism. Now, now the, the troubling part, I've got a lot of, lot of troubling part. My therapist makes a lot of money. So uh, off of me. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> There's a lot of layers to peel back because, you know, I've got, you know, I had a dad that was, and my dad's an amazing man, uh, quit drinking and doing all of those things. But, you know, he was a little absent in those years. So a youth pastor at the church took me under his wing. He was like a father to me. Um, and so he's telling me one thing, you know, I mean, this was the kind of church where women could not wear pants, uh, like even inside oh, the home. Wow. Okay. It's the kind of church where, you know, the only kind of music you could listen to would be symphony music. But at the time, my mom was making a journey too and a shift of faith. Now she's still in the faith, but she went from really conservative and now she would be like Pentecostal, maybe mildly Pentecostal. And so as she's shifting, she's telling me at home, it's okay to listen to, and this will sound crazy to some of you guys, to listen to worship music. And then I'm going to church and being told how, how, how wrong that was. Um, so, you know, even listening to worship music was not okay yeah. by Bob no. Jones's standard. No, no. Wow. not at all. So it's a pretty conservative separatist kind of church. Um, you know, the crazy thing is I remember being loved at that church mm. though, because as a young man, you hear the preaching and you're like, really, do I really have to do that? So, and can I just be honest? It really fucks you up. It really does. My entire view. I just asked my therapist the other day. I said, I don't know what normal looks like. She was asking about my family, like my kids. And I said, can you just tell me what a normal <laughs> dad is supposed to do? I mean, it's not like I didn't have a dad to show me, right? But I don't know because you're taught such black and white thinking. You're taught that there is the exact certain way to live. Now, the church that we eventually started was nothing like what I grew up in. It was the kind of church where we had drums, we had band, we had jeans, you know, one of these cool hip churches, whatever. Um, I didn't even know what, no I, I, I don't know what normal looks like. And you know where I, where I finally discerned that was at an RFR meeting. It was here at my house and we had Jehovah's Witness couple come in. And I was blown away because they were scared to death, said it took them like a year to finally work up the courage to come to our group. And she said, she said the same thing. She said, I don't know what normal is. I don't, mm. our kids don't know how to socialize with other kids. Mm. We don't know what a birthday party is. We don't know what a holiday is. We don't know what normal is. And it hit me hard that night. I don't either. Now, maybe not at that extreme, but I don't know. I don't know if I'm doing these things right. So I didn't expect to get so emotional tonight. So my apologies. No, but it's, it's, it's perfectly you're, you're okay. Getting... And we appreciate your vulnerability. Yep. You know, I mean, I would be surprised if it didn't affect you. So, you know, don't apologize for showing emotions. Feeling's going to feel. Yep. So it's, it's perfectly all right. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, this is what we, this is what we would deal with in, with many of the people in the clergy project. Now, there are many people that join that have been out for 20 years and they figured it out. They might have gone through all of the shit. They might have already gone through the family loss, the family rejection, the loss of career, the loss of this. And they find us. But we deal with a lot of people. Um, I was just talking with Lon who's our president, Lon Ostrander, um, right before the call, that's why I was a couple minutes late. I said, do you have any idea why? Uh, and Maureen is our main screener. Um, 
that that kind of vets and and then pushes people off. But we've had this year seventeen active and seventeen former. We've never had that before. So we have a lot of people right now that are that are actively still in the ministry and trying to get out. And these are the people that we really, at least when I was screening them, I was following up regularly with them because I also didn't understand mental health. I mean, of course, we're taught counseling in seminary and you think Mm -hmm. you can make it through. I never used to understand when people would sit in my office and say, I have suicidal thoughts. And I'd be like thinking to myself, I didn't say it. I wasn't this much of an asshole, but I didn't say the joy of the Lord is your strength. But I thought it, I thought, what, what aren't these people getting, you know, but I had a great job. I was looked up to, I was respected. Everybody knew me. My life was great. You know, I knew where I was going when I died and these people are hurting. And, you know, even in the evangelical world, I mean, it's more accepted today than it was even in 2012, 2010. But medication for depression or anything like that, you just weren't giving your entire life over to God, right? So I didn't understand that. And so when I found myself, you know, just the first year out, because it's not what I wanted to do. I would have bet a million dollars in my bank account if you would have asked me in 2011, if I would be doing this talk tonight, not a gambling man, but I would have bet it. And I'd have lost. And, and, and when my life deconstructed because I could no longer believe in a God that would send somebody to an eternity in hell, and there were more reasons than that. I mean, there's plenty of reasons. But the more I traveled around the world and got out of my bubble and I met more people, and I traveled to speak in other countries, I started doing the math. I started thinking about it and all of those things that I had pushed off into the back closet, because what we tend to do is we tend to, when you confront a theological problem or a scientific problem, many people take that and they put it in this back closet and they shut the door. Well, I'm sorry, they they go find an answer. Okay. You go find a, a, a reasonable answer, whether it be Ken Ham, as if that's reasonable, <laughs> or apologetics, you know, the study of the defense of the faith. You go and you find this answer, it pacifies you, even as a theological person. Of course, you don't preach about that. I never once preached a sermon on the 4,192 contradictions of scripture. You don't do that. You don't you just don't do that. So you take those things, you tuck them away in the back of your mind. And, you know, all of a sudden, one day, all of those things come out. I I began with telling you the story and I got sidetracked in seventh grade. I used to sit, there was up on the science room, there was the nine month development of an embryo, a fetus, right? And I'm, I'm sitting there in my head, the ADD kid that I was thinking about science that I was being taught about evolution versus what I was being taught in the church. And it really didn't make sense to me because what science was teaching was, I I would sit there and say, that looks like a tadpole. That looks like a, you know, I would sit and look at the continents on the globe and I'd be like, I remember going and asking my pastor, I'm like, bro, like the continents look like they fit together as a puzzle. Oh no, that's, that, that can't you know, that's just what scientists wants to tell you. And that's what Satan puts in your head to lead you astray. So one day when that door is kicked open, um, the more I loved God, the more I loved people. And that sounds arrogant, but the more I loved God and the more I loved people, I thought this, and I'll lay in the plane with this, Eric, but I thought if the God of the Bible is the God that I have to serve for the rest of eternity, then I must be a more moral being than him because Mm. if I go to heaven and he puts these crowns on my head and I have this golden mansion and I walk the streets of gold, the first thing I'm going to do is walk up and throw my crowns down at his feet. Like the Bible says, and then say, could you please send me to hell? You, you know, rotten bastard, because I'd rather burn in hell for eternity than to sit in heaven and party and get fat and, and, and sing songs to you for the rest of, of my life while I'm thinking about people literally burning and screaming in hell. 
Wow. That's, do it. that's, it, that's pretty powerful. And it's, it sounded like it was a, an accumulation of stuff over time, but then there was just one yep. time or one thing that busted open this closet. You were keeping all this, these um, doubts and cognitive dissonance in here. Wow. Charles, what a story. Yep. Uh, and so then you were kind of stuck in this uh, professional role as a spiritual leader. You ha- were going through this. And what happened after that? How did you um, either find the clergy project or how did you kind of continue to preach from the pulpit um, with these thoughts in the, going on in the front of your head? <laughs> so... So again, I don't, I, I, my story could take several of these sessions. So let me just tell this quickly. I, I was, I was in between church plants. Um, and the one thing that you don't want to give to somebody that stays busy is a little more time, a little more time on my hands. And mm-hmm. I, I really sought out for a year. They gave me a year kind of, they call it a sabbatical. We were going to start a church in Columbus. That was our next church plant. And I had time to really figure out, I was trying to figure out, was I in the right denomination where the gifts of the spirit, you know, like shit, shit that you read in the Bible, <laughs> like it, it, stuff wasn't stacking up. Right. And so I, it, it wasn't a doubt for me, but it was like um, trying to really find the best because there's so many different thoughts and denominations and ways to interpret the Bible. So I really sought it out. YouTube was big at the time. It was kind of just, I don't know when it kicked off, but this would have been 2012, 2013. I sought out spirits. I sought out demons. I sought out true miracles because they always seem to happen on the other side of the world. And the the miracles that happened in my church were the guy that went and was healed of cancer, but really it was a surgeon that took out his, his cancer out of his body in the chemotherapy. So I really sought that out. And my wife and I never talked about any kind of doubts. I I will say that maybe a year or two before that, Rob Bell's book came out called Love Wins, which is about the problem of hell. And I didn't want to read it. But his little promo video, if you haven't read it, it's or if you haven't watched his promo video, it's actually kind of powerful because it's it left an impression on me that that kind of wound down. Uh, my my faith journey. But as I was seeking out to see what denomination, I mean, I went to the Vineyard Church and took classes on how to speak in tongues. And being the kind of person that really wanted to vet truth, because it, it might not seem like truth might be all that important with all the cognitive dissonance that went on with me, it's very important. And so that's why I was just trying to discern what the truth was. What is the truth? And my son is, he, he's just a all of my kids are brilliant. They're just wonderful kids. He, he's pretty brilliant. I'll brag on him. Summa cum laude, graduated mm-hmm. with yesterday, 4.0 Ohio State. He's an intern at the U.S. House of Representatives right now. Just a smart kid. Was reading the stream. Awesome sauce. Very, huh? Awesome sauce. <laughs> he, he, he brought a book home on the string theory in like sixth grade. And I'm like, man, I got to catch up with this kid. So long story short, as I was seeking all of these things out, trying out these different churches, trying to figure out where you're going to land, my son uh, came up to me, and there's several other stories in here, but this would be the final one. And he came up to me, we were on the back deck of our uh, house, and he said, Dad, I've been reading the book of Revelation today, which every kid does, right? He was in seventh grade. So I was reading the book of Revelation. He said, why does God have to be so mean? I said, well, what do you mean, son? Said, Why does God have to be so mean? You know, plagues, boils, blood up to the horse's bridle. Why, why can't he just snap his fingers and everybody just like silently go to sleep? Why does he have to be so mean? And again, there's a few other stories in there that connect this. But at that very moment, um, I, 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 I struggled a little bit because at that moment, I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, you're right, kid. And I gave him the Bible answer. You know, God is just, he's all powerful. His ways are higher than our ways. You know, who are we to question God? 
you know, these are sinful, unrighteous people. They're getting their due justice. Doesn't this sound horrible? But that's what I said. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. Truth is really important to me. It really is. And in that moment, when my son, he looked at me, he goes, oh, okay, okay. He walked away. And, but in that moment, I knew that I had lied to my son. And we had never, I'd never talked to my wife about any of this stuff. And I was terrified. I knew I had lied to my son. I said, oh my gosh, I don't believe this. I had never read Dawkins. I had never read Hitchens. I had never read any of this stuff. I knew who they were. We were told not to read them because it would infect your mind, right? And I did what you should always do. The wisest thing you could ever do. I thought, oh my goodness, I'm going to march right in and tell my wife. <laughs> and we are a very unique story for the clergy project. There are a few people that might have had this experience, but I walked in. I said, honey, I've got to talk to you about something important. And she looked terrified and said, what? I said, I don't believe this anymore. Mm. She said, what don't you believe? I said, I don't believe anymore. What don't you believe? In, in hell or God, or I said, in God. And the craziest thing, my wife looked at me and said, oh, good, because I haven't believed for six months. <laughs> and so <laughs> I really expected her to like walk out that day. I thought between the deck and my living room, I thought, here comes my divorce. Mm. And wow. so I think we were a little bit unique in that. Uh, but a lot of these people that come to the clergy project, they don't have, you know, that same story. I mean, my wife and I never talked about doubts. It is a little weird. And I did have time off, like I said, to think about it. And I think the biggest thing, because some of you are wondering, like, well, is this going to stick? I mean, it was 2012. And one of the things, if you want to defend the faith, well, you do have to know the other side. Now, I'd never read a, a ton about atheism. But I could defend the faith. I mean, I, I could defend the faith. And all of those cards came crashing down because unbeknownst to me, I was so cognitively dissonant. I, I was so lying to myself that when I knew I lied to my son, I knew the charade was up. I was just way too scared to ever be alone with my thoughts and think through that on my own. What a powerful story, Charles. Yeah, Thank you powerful. so much for sharing that. Um, I'm looking at the, the video feeds and there's hardly any dry eyes <laughs> from what you've shared. It's touched a lot of people. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And so you, how did you find the, the clergy project? Um, what, what, what was the impetus to seek out maybe the other folks kind of went through something or similar? Well, you know, being a guy that built up this ministry and traveling around the country, I mean, I have entrepreneurial skills, I had counseling, mm -hmm. I, but I found myself in a place where, uh, circling back to the story of, I mean, I, I'm not afraid to admit it, I, I had uncontrollable, like, thoughts of, of just dying. And, you know, because I was terrified, I couldn't tell my, my, my parents, my family, the town. I mean, I grew up with these people. I love those people. Still to this day, I love these people. Right? Yeah. I mean, their family, their friends. It's hard. It's still hard to this day. That's why I still have a therapist. And I'm so thankful for RFR and TCP and the Secular Therapy Project because I've told you guys before, I mean, I think it's safe very well could have saved our lives. Um, so I just started seeking things out and, you know, thankfully we had the internet and I found this, I found the clergy project and I, again, I wadded up three applications to them because I was sure that somebody was going to find me out. Um, and, you know, I finally applied and, you know, wonderful people like Maureen and Lawn and, I don't know who all's on here because I can barely look at the screen tonight, guys. But, um, you know, they just welcomed me with open arms and they said, it's OK, you're not alone. And I couldn't believe it that there was that many people 
that shared my same story. I was not alone. And, you know, you build up net, little networks and, and there's a search tool. So I found people in the area. That's actually how I found RFR. One of the guys that was in the clergy project was leading a really small group for RFR here in Columbus. Um, and that's, you know, when you start meeting other people and talking to them, you realize you're not alone, you're not crazy. And from there, I found the Secular Therapy Project after I went through two therapists, because I didn't know about the Secular Therapy Project. And I had two therapists that made it worse for me because they didn't understand my story. They didn't understand the exodus out of religion. They said, why don't you just go tell your parents? I think you would feel better. I'm like, can you give me some pointers? <laughs> so, you know, I, I eventually found the tool on you all's website and was connected with the therapist who said, yeah, let's not do that yet. <laughs> understanding it from the clergy's mm -hmm. uh, position or uh, experience in the clergy project, you filled out an application yep. and you um, were then uh, vetted. And did yep. you have an interview? And yep. um, once you were interviewed the, uh, and they said, Hey, yeah, this, you're a great candidate. Did they let you into a private uh, chat room and you got to meet people through there? Um, yep. Okay. So, so yeah, let's, let's shift that and, and away from just my personal story. But to be honest with you, I, my story is very much like so many people yeah. in the clergy project. So that's why I wanted to share that. But, um, and yeah, and so I can totally see that. And I'm really glad because um, I can, from hearing your story, I can see how different it is from mine in some sense, but similar. Um, but the struggles that you were facing were uh, almost multiplied uh, in some sense as a, as a religious leader. Yeah, and it's great to have a community like that because when you have an identity that's wrapped up in saving the world, <laughs> yeah, what do you want to do when you finally find your new truth, <laughs> right? <laughs> so the best thing was running into other people. Um, you know, that said, yeah, don't go do that right now. Why don't you just figure out who you are? I was a hot mess already trying to figure out how to get a new career and keep my family and, you know, deal with all the nonsense that was going on. Um, so the clergy project um, has the, the, the main, uh, we, we have three main points that we or, or three main foundations. The first is a super secret backdoor community online forum. Um, we've got, um, you know, all kinds of forums that you can get into coming out issues, couples issues, children and family issues, emotional and psychological issues, medical and health issues, um, humanism, science, philosophy, religion, social media, just all kinds of things that whatever issue you're facing at that time. So if it's, how do I talk? To, I, I just went on there today and looked and there's several new people that have posted about relationship issues. How do I tell my wife? You know, how do I tell my family? So the online forum was what the original uh, launch point was in 2011 for the clergy project. And you can go on there and you can post and people will follow up and they will give advice um, I'm so busy that I, I tend to not write novels to people. I'll just send them my phone number, say, I think I can maybe share my story. Because we do a lot of that, just like we do at RFR. We don't want to give advice because everybody's situation might be unique. But our story is powerful. And sharing our story is, is comforting and it's educational and it's sometimes the best therapy you can have. Uh, the second thing that we do is through a generous a grant from the Stiefel Foundation. They gave $100,000 for what's called um, our uh, TAG grant, which is Transitional Assistance Grant, which is to help with career changes. How do you write your resume to fit into what you're trying to get into? We just had two people graduate from the revamped program. A, a great guy uh, who's been on some of these calls too. Joe Pittenger runs that now for us. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think it's 20 some sessions on how to revamp, how to interview. I mean, I was a horrible interviewer. I was a great talker, but mm -hmm. 
but I had no idea how to interview in the corporate world. They thought I was crazy. I mean, I thought I hired all these people. I'd certainly know how to interview. Oh, I was horrible. I had no idea. So we, we provide, we provide career, you know, guidance and transition uh, suggestions for what people can do for other potential careers. Um, and the third thing is it, it, it's in conjunction with you all. And that's why RFR TCP is really a blur in my mind, except for the fact that at this far end is TCP where you have to be clergy. And that's the secular therapy project because you could just tell a lot of these people and Maureen can probably, you know, speak to this as well, that when you talk to them, you can just feel and hear, and we're not trying to diagnose this, but you can see the mental, yeah. uh, just the, the mental trauma that they're going through. And so we connect them up with, um, you know, a secular therapist, hopefully in their area that can help walk them through that. Um, and believe it or not, many of them are resistant to it right off the bat, you know, it's tough. It's tough stuff to unpack, but then there's other people that want to go and, and get the help that they need. So those are the three facets that we provide. That's, that's beautiful. It sounds like it kind of supports uh, the folks coming out of the clergy project exactly how they need it to be. Do you feel that um, there's an additional program or additional something that um, these uh, clergy members uh, need that uh, the clergy project isn't able to address right now? Hmm. The wonderful thing about our community is that if you want the help, you can get it. If you want to network with people, cool. you can figure that out. If you, we're all volunteers. I mean, thank goodness for some of these people that give just a ton of time. Uh, to the organization as I do, because if it weren't for the volunteers that are also working full-time jobs, and by the way, we're still struggling, <laughs> you know, that's why, how long did it take me to get you this outline? You know, because <laughs> I'm, I'm working a couple jobs and I'm doing RFR, yeah. I'm doing PCP. Um, it, it's tough, but if you really want to connect and figure it out, it's there. It's there. So, I mean, the biggest thing that's probably missing, and this is going to sound like a really bad pastoral thing is, I mean, I think we receive about 900 bucks a month. So obviously okay. if people feel, feel the, the, you know, feel like this is something that they would want to donate to, you know, certainly that's probably our biggest piece. And I'm kind of in charge of, of that in the next year of trying to, you know, raise up, you know, a little bit stronger funding so that we can help. One of the things that we'd like to help with now that comes to mind, and it really is because of a lack of funds, is um, some of these pastors would get out kind of, I, I really believe that they would get out right away if we could provide them just a few months of rent and things like that. I mean, you know, think mm. about it. It's, yeah. Yeah. So I think that, um, uh, you make a really excellent point that uh, how valuable community is uh, to to folks because it's not just about like chatting on Facebook or in a in a ICQ chat like way back in the day or AOL or something. It's not about that at all. You nailed it when you said like this is about networking. This is about uh, how 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 do I do even some of the very basic stuff that folks aren't used to. And if the community is open to it and um, open to really being empathetic um, uh, towards these folks and understand where they're coming from, that is incredibly valuable. I'm uh, and it, it shouldn't be understated how important the community is. Yeah, I mean. Go ahead. I, I was going to ask you on top of that, like I was going to pick you back off, Eric. So what kind of um, skill sets are you looking at? Like, if people want to volunteer to help like train clergy members to transition into like the working world, um, what kind of skills are you looking for that people would be able to volunteer to do to help train? Well, well and that's a tricky one. And that's okay. one thing that I wrote down tonight because of the super confidentiality part. I, I'm not sure because I, I really appreciated that question that was on the list of, you know, how could our people help? 
Um, so I guess the person would have to say, yes, I'm okay being out. Because most people, when they join, they have a pseudonym. I mean, we're scared to death. We don't trust mm -hmm. anybody. Right? right, I understand That's that. True. So, you know, it, it, was, it was very difficult. I mean, I couldn't go back to being a police officer. Um, I, I actually got injured at the police department. So it just wasn't going to work out for me. That's the only thing I could think of doing. Um, I mean, I, I, I knew that I had other skills, but what in the hell are those? I mean, I, I wouldn't know. I mean, literally the rug was pulled out from underneath me. And that's the same for a lot of them. Now, some people, if they had transitioned, maybe they were selling insurance or they were doing this or they were a part-time, what's called bivocational pastor, they can slide back into that part easy, easier. So not everybody has the trifecta of broken marriage, mental health, career. I mean, and some people do. Some people might have one of the three. But as far as jobs, I mean, you know, we see a lot of our people. Uh, I was super proud of this one gentleman that called me not long ago that he's gone back and he's he just completed his his degree to become a licensed therapist, like mm -hmm. did the whole nine yards. And, he, you know, he, he really has a focus around religious trauma because he understands that. And he started a therapy practice. So a lot of people do. Uh, look toward counseling, they look toward, um, some people have gone back and got teaching degrees, but these are pretty daunting things, right? I mean, I don't know, I, I'd recommend a lot of people go apply at Target right now. I saw they're giving out, <laughs> they're gonna pay your college now. So, right. <laughs> I mean, but think about it, just all of a sudden you have to completely change your job and you know, you, you can't lie on a resume. I mean, how do you spin your career as a pastor and a master of theology? I mean, what in the hell is that? Um, okay. Oh, uh, so we talked about some of the, the projects that, uh, or some of the, the foundational parts of um, uh, the clergy project. Um, are there any project that you guys are currently working on that, um, uh, might be we can expect to see or um, uh, soon enough uh, that would be helpful for folks. Yeah, I mean, I can speak to like what I do as the communications director, and unfortunately, it's the tyranny of the urgent. I mean, we've got a back order issue at work, and I've got surgeons calling me saying, "I've got patients bleeding out on the table. Get me a damn device." <laughs> And so like many of you at your jobs, you might be expecting labor or you might be experiencing labor shortages. You might be experiencing back orders like me. It's just crazy. And so a lot of these things as a volunteer, if you want to do it right, it just takes some time. So we've been talking about this for a long time, but we're actually, uh, so, so we are going to, you know, amongst our members, um, do some polling of our members really reach out, start to get a little bit more data over these last 10 years. That's something that we haven't followed up with a ton of people. And so we'd love to hear that. We, we'd like to raise some funds. And then one of the things that we're going to do is share stories from the clergy project, because one of the things that I've noticed, you can go to YouTube and a pastor can be sitting in the middle of the woods and filming his deconversion story on a dark camera and it, it barely makes any sense and it'll have like a million views. Now, don't ask me why the same people that lead people astray, like myself, are the ones that people can't wait to hear their deconversion story from. I know it's a little counterintuitive, but that's just how it works many of the times. And so we're just going to share our stories. So we're going to do a podcast, but we need another podcast. Like we need a, you know, kind of a hole in the head. Um, it's not going to be a topical. There's people that do that way better. And that we're just going to share our stories. So like, um, you know, kind of like what I did tonight, except maybe a little bit longer form where we get into our story for 30 or 45 minutes. And we're going to categorize them because Maureen's story, I know that Maureen, um, we talk about this often. She, she was a nun and in the Catholic church and her experience of recovering from religion is very different than, than us crazy evangelicals, she would say. <laughs> Maureen is um, here and unmuted. Um, yeah. 
Maureen, do you want to say something? Well, in, in asking what else the clergy project needs, I think we need more visibility, which is what Charles is addressing through podcasts or whatever. But if we're over a thousand now, there are many times more than that. Uh, people who probably are in the same boat that Charles was in and I was in that don't know that there's a place for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't advertise. So how do you get the visibility? That's one thing that and Charles is working on that, uh, along with fundraising to help uh, people who need some, you know, have just have fallen through the cracks and in, in between jobs. Uh, and then uh, my personal experience is that uh, we have participants who uh, are in the Secular Therapy Project through recovery, but the therapist uh, has to be in the state that the participant is in. They have to be licensed there. And that's, I don't know how many therapists you have and how many states are actually um, covered. And then we tell them that if one therapist doesn't work out, they can try somebody else as you would in any other situation. So I don't know what the variety of people, but now I'm in Maine. And I know there's somebody who very badly needed a therapist, a secular therapist. Um, and there was no one in Maine for that person. I think they applied, there wasn't. So uh, I would say the therapy list is wanting. Mm -hmm. Got it. Along with the so, so and, and becoming more visible to uh, people who, who they don't know they need us, but they do. Yeah. So it sounds like the main way people uh, can find you is through the internet, just an internet search uh, at the moment. You guys don't do any advertising, um, uh, but it sounds like you're starting to make some of the, the podcast rounds to kind of get the, the word out a little bit more. Um, there are, there are printed, uh, there's printed material. There are magazine okay. articles about us. There are uh, books that talk about the clergy project. Uh, the internet's a big thing. Um, on you have brochures that you leave in churches and things like that? <laughs> Say that again? You have brochures that you leave in churches? And <laughs> I, I had that idea years ago. Why don't we just send a, a letter to all the pastors in America and say, just letting you know we're here. Uh, that didn't go over too well. So. <laughs> Maureen would do it too. Don't mess with Maureen. And, well, I thought I thought something an old-fashioned mail would be more effective than sending, you know, the thousands of email of uh, emails that people get. I thought a nice, very simple letter. We're here if you need us. Yes. Yeah. It sounds like yeah. this is a tricky problem to get in front of uh, the people who need it because they may most likely aren't going to be in the same circles that most of us are in. They, uh, they're. Um, uh, not listening to maybe atheist podcasts or, or stories uh, or ex-religion podcasts or stories. Um, and they're still heavily inside of that community um, that they don't want to leave. So it sounds really kind of tricky to, to get to these, uh, the folks who need them. Yeah, I mean, I, we even have, I, I received a couple stories to share tonight, uh, people from other countries even that, I mean, we think we have it bad here. Um, you know, they're under the threat of death. I mean, so if we think it's bad to lose a job, they're under the threat of losing their life. Um, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a real challenge for many of these people around the, around the world. We, we do hope to make a pretty big splash when we, uh, you know, share our stories. And that's all it's going to be we're going to share our stories through podcast and people that are Baptist or Buddhist or Presbyterian or whatever can really relate to, you know, what you're saying, just like finding, you know, a therapist um, that, that can relate with you, you know? And so we hope to kind of roll it all out at the same time and, and make a little bit of a splash. The clergy mm -hmm. project made quite a splash in 2011, 2012, 13, you know, it was kind of a, a new thing and people were very interested. It's kind of time that we do that again. And it's also in conjunction with you guys, Eric, because guess what? 99.5% in America don't qualify for our little exclusive group. So really, we hope that it 
we wanted to bring awareness to the clergy project because people don't know about us. Not, I could tell you a million stories, guys, but I just talked to somebody the other day. I preached at this church down in Florida. It was thousands of people. I mean, thousands, over 10,000 people. This guy found me on Facebook. I didn't want to tell him that I was deconverted. This is the first big public thing I've ever done. That's why I was pretty nervous there, guys. Um, you know, I, I'm sure I could not believe the retweets of this. And I went, oh, shit, you know, because you got to deal with it. But, I, you know, I'm, I'm in the space where we can do that. But I talked to this guy and he kept hammering me. Why aren't you a pastor anymore? I, I said, I don't, I don't, you don't want to know the answer. I don't really want to talk about it. He kept hammering me. Well, come to find out. Finally, I said, listen, you know, and he's in Florida. And I'm up here. And I said, I, I, I'm, I, I'm deconverted. I, I no longer believe. And he goes, I'm so glad you said that and come to find out. He, he, so he's been to a couple of our online meetings now, but he said, you're the first person. He was a children's pastor at this church. And that's why I didn't want to share with him and then have everybody in the world call me like, oh my God. But he said in seven years, uh, he hasn't been to church in seven years, come to find out. He said, you're the first person I've talked to about this. My wife doesn't know. Seven years. I mean, I waited wow. seven seconds to tell my wife. Mm -hmm. And he's actually come to, like I said, a couple of our support group meetings online. So it's people like that, that haven't heard about it, that didn't know there was anything out there like us that we want to be able to do. And then the other 99.5% of people uh, that, that might hear one of our stories or something, they're going to get turned your way. <laughs> Because, you know, they, they qualify for you guys, but might not qualify for us. Well, um, we've got, let's kind of, uh, this, this has been a, just a fantastic conversation. Let's kind of wrap up with uh, two things. And uh, Maureen, you're welcome to jump in as well. Um, what, uh, what do you feel like is this, a great success story um, that the clergy project uh, can share? not necessarily about a person, but what is something that you're really proud of that came about because of the clergy project? You've been around longer than me, Maureen. I, I'll, I'll pass that down to you. What are you most proud of? I, I think that they, they really are personal stories. Um, they're people that have been in really dire straits, uh, just twisting themselves in knots over what they were doing, how they were, the hypocrisy of their lives and have uh, have found the, the support. They're not alone. They're not the only one that this happened to. And, you know, when we don't like to say you lost your faith, most of us have ditched it. It isn't some precious thing that we, you know, that fell by the wayside. We thought it through one way or another, through the Bible or whatever circumstance. And, um, They've come, they've come through that and the support is there for them and they mm -hmm. have found uh, more mental peace and joy in the world and joy in their own uh, natural lives. And they have found that they are good without God and that this is their one and only life. They're not living for the next one. Uh, in the best of situations, maybe the family has come along with them and they haven't lost too many friends, but that's not too common. It's usually been at, at least uh, some people have had to even leave town if they've been in a big church or, uh, in, in town and wherever they go, people recognize them. And it's, the, you know, they've got the, the big A on their forehead. That's not an easy way to, uh, to live uncomfortable standing in line at the supermarket. So uh, people have had to move with that. But I think the success stories are personal. People living miserable lives begging God, first of all, to please give me my faith back. What have I done wrong? I'm trying so oh, wow. hard to save souls. And have, uh, have found their way through that and found that life is worth living without God. I can't think of a better success story than that because uh, I, I experienced a similar thing. Um, and Helen, you might be able to, to say something like that too, but in as a support group leader, I-, I Oh yeah. It, yeah seeing people walk in to the meetings broken and at the end of the rope and then walk out of the meeting with hope and, and um, an experience of courage uh, and bravery is, uh, and 
the seeing the the light at the end of the tunnel is so fulfilling and and uh, yeah it's, um so we'll kind of wrap up this discussion with kind of one final question um before we go to the q a session <laughs> what do you see as uh the future for the clergy project you know i think the future of the clergy project is um just continuing to do what we do um i mean this was a big step for me i, I yeah. came out in 2012 um for years on my rfr for my rfr group my support group on meetup that's not easy to find i didn't even put my name i don't know if you guys were around then i wouldn't put my name on there um you know it was a big step for me to put my name um, and this is a big step tonight because this is a pretty big public thing, you know, that got tweeted out and I'm sure I'll get emails and hate mail and things like that because there have been a few people that have, have found some things out. But, you know, I I'm ready for that now and I'm okay with that. You're still worried about it because Columbus, Ohio is still, unless you're downtown, as soon as you step out of downtown, it's it's kind of the semi Bible belt, right? The heartland of America. Right. Um, we, we had a, a psychology professor from Ohio. Oh shit. Can you get, can you, that might be too confidential. We had, uh, anyway, this person was going for um, their tenure and, and this person explained in our group that they were scared to death to share that they, and this is psychology at Ohio state that they were, no longer a believer. And so many people still fear for their jobs because especially with the rise, it's not, it's not like politics and religion and mixing the two or anything new, but it really has hit a, a heightened point. And so again, when you say I, I deconverted, um, they immediately put you in a camp and that can cause you a lot of problems. So we're seeing a lot of exodus from the church, right? And these people, just like the original vision that Dan Barker and Dan Dennett and Richard Dawkins and, you know, just all of the people, there are so many people, too, that were instrumental early on in the clergy project, um, envisioned a, a halfway house for people coming out. Because I, I think it's going to just continually, exponentially grow the amount of people that are coming into the clergy project. Yeah. And I know you guys have seen tremendous growth. I mean, we've had over a thousand people in our support group in Columbus, Ohio, and I have not advertised one time. We just put something on meetup. I mean, over a thousand people. So there's such a need. And I think that's just going to continue to grow exponentially. Um, Charles Marine, thank you so much for sharing your story and kind of talking about the clergy project. This, this has been just fantastic. Um, there's been a lot of love and empathy in the chat as I've been watching it. And we also have got quite a few, um, questions that have been asked too. And, um, Marine, if you want to stick around and, and help with some of the questions, it'd be great. But Helen, you want to start off with asking the first question? Absolutely, I can do that. Let me scroll up here. Okay, so the first question that came up is, um, this is kind of towards the beginning of your talk of free of supernatural belief is very broad. So someone believes in an afterlife. So even in that paradigm without a God is this excluded? Examples out of body experiences, dream messages, um, near death experiences, et cetera. So do you get some of that, you know, when you're dealing with people that are diverging that are from um, in the clergy project? Mar Maureen's a good one to answer that because <laughs> you are the screener. And we, we say, I mean, this is a, a big gray area, more gray than black and white. Mm -hmm. People want to consider what's supernatural, what's spirituality, uh, what is God, what are all the, the entities that, you know, uh, so while the clergy project, where we don't want to encourage people to uh, their doubts and to give up their faith, they come to the clergy project after they've come to that conclusion as best as they can, as best as we can know. And it is uh, the belief that there is no supernatural force directing our lives, having, having created, there is no afterlife, uh, there is no God, no heaven, no hell, no angels. And uh, we kind of go with that atheist is without God 
and the forces that God would be. So uh, we have ha we had do have, and it's a I guess it's a individual. We we have um, some pagans, we have some Wicca. Um, what else? Uh, Buddhist. And so those are kind of like I say, the gray area is bigger than the, mm -hmm. than the black and white areas. That, you know, for every definition of spirituality, uh, this. Uh, but anyway, that that's basically. Yeah, and that's yeah. The, 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 some of those groups are newer, and, and yeah. we're kind of trying to trudge through that. But yeah. you know, the majority of our people. So so, and I think the main reason behind that uh, is because. We aren't a place like RFR could be a place for people that still have one foot in and one foot out. Um, but the clergy project, you know, you're going through such difficult times. We don't need people on there that are actually putting doubt upon people's doubt. Do you, do, do you guys know what the denominational breakdown of your members? I would assume it's mostly Christian, but uh, how many uh, ex rabbis or um, ex priests or ex-imams are, are currently being served by the clergy project? I think Charles has the stats in front of him. Well, I do, I, I do, but in order to count those up, I'd have to do an Excel thing and that would take way too long. <laughs> let, let me just tell you this, because I did write this down as possibly something to say. So in 2021, so far we've had three Church of Christ, six Pentecostal, one Lutheran, two Methodists, seven Baptists, um, two Presbyterian, three Evangelical non-denominational, five Anglican Episcopal, one Seventh-day Adventist, two Catholic, one Brethren, and one Buddhist. And a partridge in a pear tree, I assume. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> wow. So. Got it. Uh, and just kind of, uh, do you have any idea the percentage of the clergy who currently are in front of the pulpit don't know about uh, clergy project and um, are, are, are non-believers. Do you have any, any guesses or anything like that? That don't know about the clergy project? Uh, well, like you take all of the clergy uh, as one and uh, they are currently working and how many do you think <laughs> or suspect are no, not, not believing? I suspect it's a very high number, a very high percentage. And especially, especially now, there's just so much more information there, and there's there people can can feel that there are others with them, and that their doubts are not, uh, you know, coming from an evil place. That they begin begin to have a wake up call. They're having a, an epiphany, and uh, it's more comforting to stay where they are. It's more secure to stay where they are. But, and so I think if they knew about the clergy project, they might make that step and explore and admit to themselves what's how I think it I think just from the from the Catholic uh, priest standpoint I think there's probably one priest told me when he joined that by the time they they were through seminary and ready for ordination that he thought that the uh, probably 80 percent of the seminarians oh, wow. did not believe in transubstantiation this is before ordination. Now, this is a big deal. It's not to most of you, but in the Catholic Church, that is the basis of the is, it's the Eucharist is the yeah. makes us different than than the Protestants. And so, to hear him say that, uh, I was shocked. And I think. Well, it's and, and I, oh, sorry. I thought you were done. Go ahead. I, it's really interesting. Maureen and I have good conversations because being an evangelical or a Baptist or a Pentecostal is very different on how people enter the clergy project. I see that with my RFR group. I, the, the, the folks that are Catholic, you know, after all of these years, it's, it's, they kind of fit into a pretty, you know, whoop. And then those people that were evangelical or more of the conservative faith, they, they tend to struggle a lot more and they tend to struggle with their faith. Those people that are more right leaning in their theology, they are the ones that very well, and Linda LaScola or somebody would be good to talk to because she did the in-depth research, her and Daniel Dennett, 
uh, about some of these backdoor things that were confidential, but those people that are to the right of literalist in the Bible, so there's a line that you cross when you go from literalist interpretation to more of a liberal theology. And those people that are more liberal in theology, they tend to be the ones that are willing to stay and maybe even stay longer um, because they've already had several progressions of maybe little mini losses of faith and theological mm -hmm. positions, unlike those of us over here that instead of having a loss, we create an excuse or a reason of cognitive dissonance to hide in that back closet and forget about. I don't know if that makes sense. So I would say, I wouldn't say in the evangelical church, it's super high because the, I, I mean, it could be 20%, 25. I don't know how many struggling, but typically there's such passion involved and there's such, it's such a whole giving of like your entire heart and spirit and being and all of this stuff that I probably shouldn't even still be using these terms that those are the people and you can see in the numbers reflected seven Baptists, six Pentecostal. I mean, that's what we yeah. tend to see because those are the people that are like, I don't know if I can keep doing this anymore because I'm going to be found out. Got it. That was a long explanation. I'm sorry. No, it's, it's fantastic. It was just what was needed. Helen, what do we have next? Um, so, um, so this kind of ties into what have we been talking about. So have you found that, um, former clergy, do they tend to like navigate with other beliefs um, during their reconstruction period or the people that come to you are pretty much done with any sort of like any sort of like religious or spiritual belief? Yeah, they have to be. Okay. They have to be. So, so there are some people, and Maureen can maybe answer it better, but I think the answer is if, if they're not quite there yet, uh, they would be asked to reconcile that and potentially come back because of the confidentiality. We have had people, this question might already be posted, we have had people join the clergy project and reconvert. And mm -hmm. that's, you know, I mean, it's not a super high percentage. I actually think we have a list of people that have identified as that, but it has happened. So we certainly don't want people coming in and being nosy or outing a bunch of people. So they need to be done. Yeah. It kind of makes sense though, because the, the fact that you're, you're when you're deconstructing and two, you have to re completely reconstruct your life. Sometimes, you know, you stay in hell because you know the streets. So you go back to it and fall back into it because that's what you know. And, and the, the actual process of it, you know, from what you're describing sounds um, like they're climbing up, you know, a hill with only a knife to pull you up, you know? So, you know, it seems very, you know, that it, it kind of makes sense that some of them would just fall back into a belief system and go back to where you're, they were doing, doing before. I would say in 10 years and over a thousand people, there may have been 10 people who wanted to be okay. removed from the roster. Mm. It, it probably, I know it happens a lot more maybe in with lay people. Yeah. I, I know that. Yeah. I think because, listen, once you, once you are a pastor and you have expressed your lack of faith and you start talking about it, it's kind of like you have the, you're going to have the plague for a long time. So mm -hmm. it, it's going to be hard to circle back. And, and we really try to make sure that people are, are are firm in 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 not believing in the supernatural. We've got time for two more questions. This has been a great conversation and it's gone long, but that's fine. Uh, one of the questions that we got is if you have already left the ministry, does that kind of disqualify you uh, to be a part of the clergy project or be brought into the clergy project? No, we're for, for current and former ministers. That's quite Got clear. And most most of our participants are former ministers. I think, I think Charles, in the beginning, you said about twenty five percent were still, were still uh, in pastoral roles. Well, we had eight hundred and thirty nine uh, former and two hundred ninety eight active. But I called Lon before this session and I said, 
Have we figured out why in 2021 we have 17 active and 17 former? Because that's that's a complete, you know, shift in in many of the things. And we have some theories, but it, I mean, it, they're just theories. It doesn't matter. But it it it, it actually does matter that, um, it, and it is encouraging that some of these people are finding us and they're still active because they're really struggling and they just can no longer do it. And really the political climate, just as it's caused an exodus from the church, um, and especially evangelical world, a lot of pastors have, that's really been a big straw for them. They, they, they you know, the straw that, that breaks it for them because they are really struggling with that. They don't want to get up and, and preach left, leftist or rightist or whatever. And these, these congregations are kind of forcing their hands. So I've spoken to a few pastors that that was the thing and they were already struggling with their faith, but they really, that kind of put them over the top. Um, this was kind of directed by uh, Catholic Nation, but I'm going to kind of expand it. Um, have you found that like, you know, with like um, Catholics and maybe Jehovah Witnesses and other people that have faced um, like the sex abuse and child abuse that has happened in some of these denominations has like kind of, that was like their straw that broke the camel's back that kind of got them to contact you. Have you found that at all? Uh, Participant, applicants who have been, have been abused in the church. Is that what you're saying? No, just the, just the, um, well, it can, it can be that too, like both, but mostly like, you know, how this, the Catholic sex abuse scandal happened a couple of decades ago. And then there's other denominations coming out with lawsuits and different things about the, the other abuse that's been going on in some of these different denominations. As any of the participants have you met that they said that this was like, you know, something they couldn't preach anymore and be a part of because of that. I have not found that. I don't think that, I mean, that's okay. a whole separate, uh, yeah, the whole pedophile scene certainly exists at well, it's well publicized in the Catholic church, but it exists in all, you know, in all, uh, all forms. I mean, you know, it's even secular, you know, the dirty uncle that, uh, you know, you can't let yeah. you here. So I don't think that's a rare thing. I, I don't see that effect in anybody coming in that has any effect on it. Okay. Got it. I know this has gone long, but I, I'm a former pastor. I, I, I didn't get a, I didn't get a chance and I don't want to start crying again, but I, I do have to give a, a monster shout out to my wife. Cause you know, she, she's put up with a lot Aww. and she suffered a lot and our family has, and she's had to watch that. And she's stuck by my side and I've stuck by her side. And I just wanted to make sure, because I think she's on the screen somewhere. So 25 years here in a couple weeks. Yeah. And that's what I consider the big, biggest success, because I really didn't think that we would make that. So I thank her and I thank my kids, because they've had to watch mom and dad struggle. Mm. And, and, you know, we're not fully out of the woods, but we're feeling a lot better. And I, I love you, babe. Thank you. <laughs> Yay, I two wonderful yeah, yeah. supportive yeah. spouses and kids. <laughs> and I'm glad that you have such a wonderful partner that is, you know, holding your hand and standing right by your side. We need more of that in the world. <laughs> yeah, thank you for saying that, Charles. I'm yep. so, it's so good to hear how you, we hear stories all the time about um, telling spouses or family members and they just walk away and they're shunned. But because uh, their God, their belief is so much more important than the family. But in your case, you were lucky yep. to have the family be the first and the priority. It's so cool. So, so yep. cool to hear. Thank you. Um, well, okay, with that said, <laughs> uh, like, all right, good night, folks. That's it. We'll wrap up on that. Um, Bye-bye. Uh, we're all done. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, um, Helen Marine, if you want to stick around for the hangout afterwards, I think that there's gonna, this has generated a lot of conversation and uh, may have some uh, stories to tell and convers uh, questions to follow up with. So thank you so, so much. Well, this isn't the last RFRX. We're going to do this again next week, right, Helen? Oh, 
Oh yeah, yep, definitely. Same bad time, same bad channel. Next week we're going to have um, Mormonism with Bryce Black Blacken Angel and Shannon Grover. If I said that wrong, I apologize. The Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints, also known as Mormonism, is a relative newcomer to the religion scene, having been around for less than 200 years, having been born out of violence and deceit. Over that time, it has, ha it has predictably adapted to changing social views and failed prophecies. In this next RFX session, Shannon Grover and Bryce Black and Angel discuss LDS history and dogma, as well as unique challenges people face when leaving this faith behind. So that will be really interesting. I'm going to watch that, man. I, lo I love learning about weird outside new religions. <laughs> my jammy <my> jam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to watch it too. That's going to be great. <laughs> well, we're going to be here um, anyway. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and again, like we said at the beginning, all of our previous RFRX recordings, they're on their YouTube channel and uh, they'll soon to be on um, the podcast as well. I'm going to drop that link again. Uh, if you have any questions, um, comments or inquiries, you can email us at RFRX at recoveringfromreligion.org. Also check out our blog and our podcast and I'm going to drop all those links uh, again as well. Yeah, so, and also, too, you can follow us on social media, so get on the Webby Webs. You can go, we have a Facebook page, which at uh, www.facebook.com, Recovery from Religion. We have a Facebook support group where you can meet with other people and um, that are part of RFR or just on the Facebook page and connect with people on there. Uh, we are on the Twitter so um, we really love the Twitter engagement. And so if you would like, if there's links that you see pop up, um, please follow us and share it, share them out. Same with Instagram. We also have a TikTok. Um, I am not on TikTok, I'm a bad person, but it is, um, I heard it's very, very awesome. That is what I've heard. And also we are, on, we, you can follow us on our newsletter um, and you can uh, sign up for that as part of, and there'll be resources and other information on there about what's coming up with us and different things you can, that's going on with recovering from religion. Um, news, um, videos, blog posts, all that jazzy stuff on our newsletter. So sign up for it, people. <laughs> I'm going to bring on our founder and president, Dr. Delray, Daryl Ray, to uh, give us some of his thoughts. Dr. Ray. Hey, thanks, Eric. And thank you so much, Charles and Maureen. Appreciate your jumping in and giving us some of your insights as well. I, I've heard about you, but I don't think we ever met. I had the honor of having uh, Charles staying at my house. Uh, it was about two, two years ago or so. We had we had hours and hours of great conversation. Oh, and some really good barbecue at Gates Barbecue in Kansas City. So uh, I, I've, I really cherish that time uh, a lot, Charles. That was, that was fun. So as you guys probably know, if you haven't heard already, we are ramping up for the excursion, the big excursion in September. And I really, really hope I get to meet some of you folks. If, I'd love to see all of you at the excursion. I just got told by Shannon Nebo yesterday that there's 70 seats at the excursion and 50 seats are gone. They're sold. So it looks like we're going to sell out again this year. It's pretty, um, pretty sure it looks to me like we sold out last time in 2019. So this is going to be an amazing time with amazing presenters. Uh, we've got Alice Gretchen coming, uh, the, the um, actually pretty well-known of uh, a Hollywood actor and actress. She's been in a number of movies. Go look at her IMDb. I can't, don't ask me how to spell her last name though. It's, um, it's, it's odd spelling for me anyway. I can't spell. So, uh, and I'll be talking, Gail will be talking. We're going to have Mandisa there and she's going to be doing all sorts of uh, karaoke. And I hear tell she may even have some competition with in the karaoke uh, area from, from some folks. But, but anyway, we, we had a great time last time. And I mean, there were tears. There were lots of tears sometimes, but there's also lots of laughing, lots of interesting things to talk about and do and share with people who've gone through the same thing you have. So we hope to see many, many of you, hopefully. And if you cannot come to the retreat, maybe if you're financially capable of it, 
Maybe you would like to help sponsor somebody because we are offering subsidies for people who cannot afford the full price. So if you want to go to our website, recoveringfromreligion.org, and hit the donate, or hit, hit the excursion button and see what's going on. And then go look at the different options for sponsoring because we're, we're trying to underwrite, make this as cheap as possible. We lost money last time. We know we're gonna lose money this time. We're not interested. We're not worried about losing money as long as we don't lose our shirts. What we're worried about is getting people um, there so they can heal. And if subsidizing that, can do it, then that's what we're going to do. And the more you give, or the more someone can give to subsidizing that, the more people we can offer it to. And last, uh, of course, you can always donate, but uh, you can always volunteer. As we've already heard, Charles has been a volunteer for like seven or eight years now, and he's done amazing work. Over a thousand people have benefited from what Charles has done uh, just from recovering from religion, and that does not count what he's done for uh, the clergy project. And we love the clergy project and we've been involved in and cooperated with them literally since almost the very beginning. Uh, I remember meeting Linda Lascola at the American Atheist Convention right after they had released the report. And I told Linda, we are right behind you. We're right here. We want to help you. And uh, that was kind of a fun thing to see them launch uh, about a year, maybe almost two years after we launched uh, the clergy project launch. Anyway, thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks, Charles, for, for talking to us tonight. Mm -hmm.